straightforward math. So what you're doing is by saying that your minimum wage, you know, is sufficient, is you're saying that it's okay that we have this perpetual declining minimum wage. And then you wonder where we're losing the middle class when more and more jobs are minimum wage jobs. This is what's happening. They're not leaving middle class and going to upper class. They're going down. So they're trying to make more and more jobs minimum wage. It's cheap as, as low as unscrupulous, conscienceless employers will pay. That's what's going on here. Okay, what we need is, you know, some of Donald Trump's trade stuff. I don't understand a lot of that stuff, but I understand enough to know this, is that it is wrong to think that we can go on in perpetuity purchasing stuff from a country where five bucks um, a day is a good pay. You can live a middle-class life. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we can't do that here on a hundred bucks a day. You know, how, how are we ever going to have open trade with a country like that? Why would they buy a product... Why would they pay 10 days work for something they could buy in their country for an hour's work? Okay, they're not going to do it. They're going to make their own stuff. We're never going to be able to sell the stuff we want to China. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just never going to work. So this idea that, you know, we're going to create enough jobs in America is just, it's a farce. The work doesn't exist. Here in Northern California, you know, they talk about the economy being great. Well, look, I've been doing landscape for well over 30 years of my life. I've done it everywhere from Key West, Florida, Las Vegas, Nevada. I've done it in Shasta County. I've done it in Humboldt County. I've done it in Santa Cruz County. I've done it all over the place. I've doing, been doing it here in Butte County, California for a long time. Okay, so I'm very well aware of the market. And I understand I've had to adjust my rates depending on the demographics okay Santa Cruz got to be the best I stuck with it I had a solid ba I didn't even have to advertise I was getting a lot of word-of-mouth work and uh, you know I could get it without telling them I was getting 35 bucks an hour and they were happy satisfied with what they got for that pay and that was that's going on 20 years ago now so uh, but around here, it's not that high, it's, and I have to compete. And I sometimes I think I'm charging too much, and you know maybe that's why business has been slow. But you know I look around me at these businesses that you know they've got you know 10 or 12 or 50 employees. How many? Some of these bigger companies, and they've got more than their market share, but they're cheating their workers. I mean, you know it, this is very difficult work, and once you know how to do it, in uh, you know very short short period of time to do it, you know as a professional then you know, your pay should be commensurate with what it, the skill okay and being self-employed is one of the best ways to get a fair pay because you got no one to blame but yourself but you need sufficient work you need to do a good job and you've got to be able to deal with customers which is not hard being nice to people diplomatic business-like but that's all an entrepreneur is that's all a self-employed person is you know, they talk about all these immigrants coming in, but people don't realize that when they come into this country, they have an advantage. When I was studying real estate, I went by this the uh, housing authority, and I got the forms for Section 8 housing. And I reviewed them because I was curious to see what was I was going to find. And there's a box you check if you're a farm worker. You see, if you're coming in under the, even if it's a pretense that you're a farm worker, you'll get bumped up on the list. You understand? So that's what's happening here. It's like cutting in line. It's not, we don't have a first come, first serve type deal when it comes to housing. They're getting bumped up. But you see, a lot of these guys end up self employed too. There's a heck of a lot of immigrants that decide to be landscapers, let me tell you. And a lot of them are much more successful than myself because they're willing to go out there and hire guys and grow their business. But I personally don't want all the headaches. But uh, anyhow, I just like to be a self-employed master gardener. And, uh, you know, I like this work for many reasons. Uh, you know, I, it's an imaginative, creative outlet, and I could put my brain on hold and think about other things, uh, not like so many jobs that don't allow that. It's an ancient trade. I like that. And I don't need to go to a gym to get a workout. You know, I'm a tough guy naturally because there's a lot of heavy lifting and, and it's, it's laborious. It's difficult. You know, it's a man's work and, and I kind of like doing it. But I'm also very good at a lot of handy work. I'm very good at a lot of various carpentry projects. Uh, I've done plenty of plumbing and uh, 
although I'm not licensed to do these things, but, you know, hey, if you're qualified, you're qualified. I was around my dad my whole life. He was a boat builder. Even though he had multiple sclerosis, which he contracted or he was told about in his mid-30s, he was in the Marine Corps. But he thinks he got this multiple sclerosis from being brought up on hot dogs and Coca-Cola. His mother died when he was eight years old in childbirth. Pretty rough. He was living in uh, Massachusetts, Shirley or Revere, Massachusetts. And uh, he had a pretty tough childhood. He had to go out and deliver newspapers and milk in the snow for 10 cents a day, which he had to contribute to the family to support it during the Depression. He decided to get into the Marine Corps, and he snuck in there when he was 16. He got into the Merchant Marine by using his brother's ID, his older brother Dan, my uncle, and got into the Marine from uh, the Merchant Marine. But anyhow, he contracted this uh, this. Uh, multiple sclerosis but he was still active he was he wrote a book back in the 1960s it was a very radical book it was actually censored it was yanked off the shelves even though it sold millions of copies it was entitled apple pie i believe it was put out by bantam uh publishers but uh anyhow yeah he went on a talk show and it was sold over a million copies or something but it was radical it involved the uh he was very much opposed to the vietnam war he was very pissed off about uh, the assassination of both Martin Luther King Jr. and JFK. And, uh, you know, he kind of snapped, I think. And he, that, he wrote that book and he put it out there. And it was kind of vulgar in a lot of ways. But, you know, it just kind of revealed the state of mind he was in. But um, anyhow... Um, he uh, also was interested in boat building, and I remember that the uh, the first boat that he actually built was in uh, in Manhattan Beach, California, Southern California. And at four years old, I helped him with that boat uh, in whatever little way a four-year-old can. But you know, I've been around woodworking, so you know the idea that I need to uh, go to school to learn how to work with wood is ridiculous. I've worked with Habitat for Humanity. You know, anybody can learn to do this stuff. It's, um, it's just kind of like if you can work with Legos, then you can, uh, you know, then you can work with wood. But, uh, you know, it's not always easy. It's not always uh, the kind of work that a lightweight wants to do. But, you know, this is the reason I, I, I like to do landscaping. So, but I'm very well aware of the, the fact that the immigrants, a lot of them are coming in from the south. And they are leaning toward these jobs, being self-employed. And it's pretty easy to do in California, particularly. California really is a, it's a Mexican-American state. I know my mother, she was born and raised in East, East L.A., and she spoke fluent Spanish. So I really like the Mexican people. In fact, south of Santa Cruz, still in Santa Cruz County, is a town called Watsonville, and it's like little Mexico down there. And in a lot of ways, I, I like it better than Santa Cruz because I like that Latino influence. And, uh, you know, I feel accepted there. I feel like they know and that I like them. They pick up my vibes. And so I've always gotten along very well with Latinos, Hispanics, and um, got no problem with them. But, you know, we have to really understand this employment thing isn't going to change. I mean, we're not going to make work by wishing we could. We've got to create projects. I mean, just filling in potholes to me would be very useful work for a lot of people. Uh, where the money comes from, I mean, look, folks, you know, bottom line, when it comes to economics, you've got to keep it simple, okay? You'll get spread too thin, you'll get too diverted and distracted into different subjects, but in different areas, but you've got to stay focused. If we just solve the one problem of unsound currency, understand, this is the single most controversial issue, and if we could, you know, just... This is a, still a message for Donald Trump there is, you know, that is your focus, man. You've got to put the Federal Reserve in, in their place, and they need to be checked and balanced. They need accountability. They need oversight. They need to be able to assure the American people that they're going to play on the up and up now, and our currency is going to steadily go up in worth until we're all free. You understand the rich have nothing to fear in their right mind. They don't unless they're evil. If we have sound currency, because with sound currency, 
your currency that you currently own will be worth dramatically more. And just remember, it's setting the captives free at the bottom. That's who it's going to feel best to because they've got nothing. They're really scratching. They're scared. They're in financially insecure. That's a very real form of fear. And you've got to have mercy. You've got to have compassion. You've got to care about these people if you ever expect to be cared about. Okay? Remember, this is not about us and our opinion of each other. Okay? This is about his opinion of us. We've got to get away from this divisive, you know, subjective unreality that's been imposed on us, forced on us, foisted on us, and understand we not only can have a new reality, but it's coming. It's coming. I mean, it's, I'm as sure about that fact as I'm sure about anything, you know, and I don't have a lot of faith, believe me. The love I feel for God is primarily the need I have for God. You see, God meets all of our needs, okay, and this is such a beautiful, wonderful thing. When we step back and we think about that, we need God to understand us. And he does. He understands what this crybaby syndrome, okay? He understands what's going on. He understands that rebellious nature, that none of us know the things we would do or not do or think or not think or say or not say if our reality wasn't skewed 180 degrees away from where it should be and will be someday. Someday, good will be in control of this world, and there will be nobody left out of the loop. Nobody that survives on the surface of this earth that doesn't get cast into hell is going to withhold a good thing from another, or else you won't be there. You will not be a threat to another human being, or else you won't be there. There are certain absolute truths when it comes to God. Not everything is subjective, okay? It should be established that death is always bad. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. But death is bad. People can say, oh, well, wait a minute. There's exceptions there, too, because, you know, this guy was really sick and in pain, and, and he died, and so that brought him relief, so it was good for him. But it, it, nevertheless, if there was no disease in the first place, you can see the death wouldn't have been a good thing in that case. And it's always bad for those that love you and are going to miss you. So death has, you know, certain absolutely bad uh, implications that we should all be aware of but um, you know and anything else that that's bad on the you know stinging insects and people say well you know if God so wonderfully loves us why would he make mosquitoes well who said that you know God did make the mosquitoes God gave power to other entities okay perhaps to make mosquitoes the story in the scripture is that there's these two very special angels with very special powers called cherubs there was Lucifer and there was Gabriel. And Lucifer had some issues. Lucifer, because he had free will, decided he wanted to exalt himself above God. He got rebellious. He got egotistical and vain. And he just wanted his throne above God's for whatever it reasons, whatever happened to him. But he went askew. It didn't mean God stopped loving him, but he could no longer reside in heaven. So he's been cast out. And that's why he's had to go to other places. And one of those places is right here on earth. This is where we've got to contend with this spirit of evil. And, uh, uh, you know, God hasn't destroyed him because his name has to be vindicated. Yes, he gave Lucifer the free will to do what he wanted to do. And so he's got to stand by that free will. He's got to be merciful. He's got to be long-suffering. He's got to show his grace. He's got to reveal that so that his name can be vindicated. Nobody's going to say, well... He was short-tempered, he acted with hubris, and you know what, I, uh, his judgment is too harsh, and uh, so I condemn God, and I'm on, you know, I'm on moral high standing here uh, because of my belief. So God's the bad guy. No, that can't happen. So it's got to happen on God's time. But justice is coming to the earth, and it will be fulfilled on the earth in his time. But each and every one of us can take responsibility for bringing that truth and helping to prepare the soil for this truth that's going to overtake the earth and it will overtake the earth it's just a matter of time before God's will is <coughs> completely implemented upon the earth and at that time 
we're not going to have the problems we have in this world. We could have been away from so many of these, in, you know, not only the natural disasters, okay, the, this renewal of all things upon the earth where there is no more stinging insects. You know, maybe God made the bats to eat up the, the insects, right? Because the bats devour a lot of, of uh, mosquitoes. So I do think it's a tit for a tat kind of thing.